Hi everybody and welcome to today's seminar. All of our own. Uh, I don't need any introduction in some ways, but many of you may be unaware of his really career and his incredible achievements. So I'd like to go through that with you. Gavin graduated with a BSc in human movement science at the University of Wollongong in 1996. He then went on to complete a postgraduate scholarship in biomechanics at the Australian Institute of Sport. Really, in some ways, his early career should have been now there. He returned to Wollongong in 1998 to undertake a PhD in the area of biomechanics with Julie Steele and Andy Cresbol, both graduates of all sports science students in WA. And during this time, he was awarded a Swedish Guest Research Fellowship. And I'm just part of his PhD research at the Karolinska, sorry, the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. And this institute has been very influential in fluid muscle physiology. And this must have inspired Gavin because in 2003, he was awarded the Karolinska Research Fellowship with a welcome trust in the UK to undertake a postdoctoral project at the University of Bristol with one of the giants of fluid muscle physiology, Professor K.W. Vanatunga. There it began working on isolated mammalian uh, split muscle fibers and investigated the contractile and non contractile contributions to force enhancement, uh, both um, and or during muscle stretch. And these papers led to a nice string of papers, so, some of which I've read, with helpful <laughs> explanations of the difficult parts from the other. Uh, now, uh, in, well, in 2006, I moved to UWA with his wife and he made uh, a very important contribution to this, uh, what was the, I don't know, the uh, School of Biomechanics, or whatever, I can't remember. I don't want to know about it, it's BBCS. But uh, he's made an important contribution to research in Sleep Muscle and Fur. He's brought in new expertise and he's opened new areas of investigation. And we've had a fruitful collaboration, collaboration so as many of you know, for about 16 years, I cannot believe 16 years, it's amazing, you know, it's gone so quickly. And it's been really fantastic to have someone like Gavin around, especially because of his experience, his background, and he's got a really unique perspective. I think that biomechanics angle has really helped us um, to discuss, you know, to bring in new ideas for projects, and just having Gavin around as a sounding board has been really, really good. So I well, thank you for that, Gavin. Uh, Gavin's also uh, actively set up many major collaborations during his time here, uh, notably with Steve Wilton, Randy Grounds, and more recently, John Fellow. And today he's going to talk about his recent findings in the area of respiratory muscle function. I'm looking forward to a, well, I know it will be an interesting, entertaining talk and maybe a little bit of a trip down memory lane for some of the silly guys in that area. Cool. All right. Thanks, Tony. Um, obviously, as, as Tony mentioned, we've collaborated quite closely on um, basically everything to do with skeletal muscle function. Uh, since I've come here. So uh, obviously Tony's been quite involved in a lot of the work that we're going to be talking about today. Um, the other shout out I'll give is to Jane Pillow in the audience here, Jane. Um, and I can thank Jane for actually the, I guess, the little push to start my interest in uh, looking at diaphragm muscle function. I actually remember the first meeting back with Jane, I think it was with Jane and Miranda actually, where Jane pushed, pushed the, um, the proposal to look at diaphragm function in her sheep model of preterm infancy. Um, and obviously, since that time, I've uh, gone on and looked at quite a lot of uh, various aspects about diaphragm muscle function. So I thought today, I'd, as Tony suggested, a little bit of a walk down history lane. I'm going to start by talking about some of the work that we did, starting with uh, the early sheep work that we've done with Jane, looking at various aspects of diaphragm function in the preterm sheep. And um, hopefully, if I can keep the time, finish off with some of more, the more recent work that we've been doing, looking at how diaphragms of fu uh, function is affected in various um, animal models of human diseases. First of all, before I get into that, though, I think it's worth just um, emphasizing the uniqueness of the diaphragm as a skeletal muscle. And in contrast to most of the skeletal muscles where the muscles are attached via tendons to, to uh, bones around the joints and regulate joint movement and so forth, the diaphragm, even from its structure, is quite unique. It still has a bony attachment, um, so it's attached on the outer surface of, to the lower ribs here, with the sternum at the front and the spinal cord at the back. But you can see it has this radial arrangement of the muscle fibers and rather than attaching to another bone, it actually attaches to this central tendon uh, in the middle. And uh, this is a view from the underneath of the diaphragm. You can also see uh, things like the esophagus and the vasculature passing through the diaphragm. So it has a unique um, shape and structure uh, and it also has quite a unique function. And obviously 
we're all familiar with the role of the diaphragm in terms of respiration. So when the diaphragm muscles contract and shorten, um, we get a flattening out of the diaphragm and in conjunction with the intercostal muscles that expand the rib cage, we get an increase in the volume of the thoracic cavity, decreasing the pressure and drawing air into the lungs during inspiration. Relaxation of the diaphragm um, results in the diaphragm returning to its dome shape and we get a decrease in the uh, volume of the thoracic cavity and the increased pressure drives air out of the lungs. So obviously the diaphragm function is, is essential for um, assisting this uh, respiration process. But also um, it's worth noting that it does perform various other functions as well. Um, and some of these are voluntary functions, so vocalization, laughing and um, so forth. There's also some involuntary elements associated with the control of the diaphragm. Um, so yawning and sneezing and things like that. Um, and as well as increased strain, maybe lacking of fiber in our diet or some, some things like that. So the point here is that the diaphragm is critically important for respiration, but it also serves a number of other important functions within the body as well. Um, it's not surprising then that the, the maintenance and the integrity of the, of the diaphragm is really important throughout life. So it's critical from the moment of our first, first breath when we're transitioning from an in utero to an ex-utero environment, the diaphragm needs to be um, uh, sufficiently developed to be able to initiate that initial spontaneous breathing. Um, and it needs to sustain various different challenges throughout life, whether it's an increased demands during um, extreme exercise, breaking a marathon world record, for example, or in disease states um, where we have respiratory complications can also increase the demand uh, on the diaphragm. Um, so the, the maintenance of the diaphragm functions throughout the lifespan is really quite important. As I mentioned, I'm gonna start by just focusing on some of the elements um, at this end of the, the life spectrum, if you like, uh, and some of the work that we've done with Jane initially looking at diaphragm function in, in preterm infants. And the real driving force for that is that um, Jane in her work as a neonatologist up at King Eddie's was dealing with patients like this on a routine, routine basis. And um, uh, obviously respiratory function and respiratory complications is a major issue for preterm infants. So just to clarify, to put in some context for later on, preterm births defined as birth less than 37 weeks of completed gestation and long term is 40 weeks. And globally, the rate of preterm birth is around somewhere around about 10% or a little bit over that varies with different um, countries, developed and undeveloped countries and various other things. But collectively, there's, there's somewhere in the order of about 15 million preterm um, births um, globally every year. So it is a, a major um, clinical uh, issue that warrants some consideration. Not surprisingly, the um, chance of survival for preterm birth dramatically decreases the earlier that they've delivered, um, and even despite improvements in neonatal care and medical technologies, there's still um, a large decrease in survival for the very premature infants. And also even the infants that do survive often go on to have quite um, complicated respiratory uh, issues that they need to, um, to overcome. Not surprising then, but um, if we look at the incidence of respiratory disease, um, we see a, a similar issue, which the, the very preterm infants have a very high uh, incidence of respiratory disease. And obviously that decreases as the um, age of the, um, the delivery increases as they approach term births. So if we look at this data, we can see that respiratory disease is one of the main causes of, of illness and death in the preterm infants. Uh, and that's really the, the focus for some of that early work that we're interested in. Now, if you think about respiratory disorders in the preterm infant, it's classically been associated with um, immaturity of the lung. And you can see some of the issues in terms of lung development here. So this is the prenatal lung development, the different phases of lung development that occur um, during gestation. And preterm infants are born somewhere within this um, third trimester here. And if you can look at some of the characteristics here, we can see that the preterm infants are gonna be born with much fewer alveoli, 15% of the adult. Um, proportional number of alveoli. There's also thickened membranes and incomplete vascularization, which um, result in inefficient uh, gas exchange from the, from the respiratory system. There's also a, a decrease in the production and function of the surfactant, as well as the presence of a small diameter high resistance airways. So the work of breathing is um, uh, quite high in the preterm infant as well. And um, in addition to these factors that affect the functioning of the lungs, there's also very rapid respiratory rates. So uh, respiratory rates in excess of about 60 breaths per minute, not uncommon. And 
the infants, and particularly the preterm infants, have a very um, highly compliant chest wall. So instead of having a very rigid uh, chest wall for the diaphragm to, to contract against, if we have a compliant chest wall, then the contraction of the diaphragm can actually contribute to collapsing of the chest wall. And in order to generate sufficient uh, inspiratory pressure, then the diaphragm needs to contract much further. So collectively, this is just illustrating that because partly because of the um, immature lung development uh, and the characteristics of the preterm infant, um, they're often exposed to situations with very inefficient gas exchange and consequently an increase in the work of breathing. Uh, and it's this increase in work of breathing in the context of diaphragm function that we were keen to investigate. So, as I said, the lung development is um, incomplete in the preterm infant, but the diaphragm is also structurally and functionally immature. So this just shows a cross-section of the um, preterm and adult diaphragm. Uh, and you can see the, um, the size and the density of these muscle fibers is um, much lower in the preterm infant compared to the adult. In addition to that, we also have a, a quite a dramatic change in the composition, the fiber type composition of the diaphragm um, from that uh, preterm birth um, through particularly in the first year of life. So this just shows the, the proportion of the fatigue resistant type one adult um, fibers. Uh, and you can see from the preterm, um, very low expression of these fatigue resistant fibers. And we get a dramatic increase in that over the first year of life where they reach the, um, the typical adult proportions. So in the preterm infants, there's also a, a very a different proportion of these fiber types in the diaphragm. And that probably contributes in some way to the reduced functional capacity as well. So this is just showing the change in the diaphragmatic or transdiaphragmatic pressure, um, which is an indirect measure of diaphragm strength and function. And we can see that progressively increases from the preterm infants through to the first month or so after life. Um, so this just characterizes some of the features about the preterm diaphragm that suggests that it's very structurally and functionally immature. And given that, um, this uh, poor integrity or compromised integrity of the diaphragm might um, influence its resilience in, in um, the infant in developing respiratory disease after it's born. So in that context, um, we're quite interested in evaluating the, um, the function of the preterm diaphragm uh, and how the um, functional capacity of the diaphragm might predispose it to um, uh, respiratory complications. But we also need to consider that in the context, in the clinical context, these preterm infants are also exposed to various other treatments that may further compromise diaphragm function. Um, so these are some of the things that we're interested in looking at um, uh, in Jean, uh, Jane's uh, preterm sheet model um, of, or, or ovine model of preterm birth. And we know that um, mothers that are expecting to del deliver preterm get uh, glucocorticoid treatments to try and help develop the or, or increase the maturation of the lungs. But the glucocorticoid exposure may also compromise diaphragm function and skeletal muscle function. Um, inflammation and sepsis um, are major factors associated with preterm infants, and we know the well characterized effect of inflammation on, on muscle strength and function. And also, the babies that are born preterm, a lot of them are exposed to respiratory or require respiratory support, often in the form of mechanical ventilation. And we know from adult studies that even short durations of mechanical ventilation can have significant impacts on uh, diaphragm weakness. So this is the context of some of the work that we're interested in, is um, what's the, the functional ca capability of the preterm diaphragm and how is it impacted by these various clinical exposures. So a lot of the first work I'll talk about is um, based on the stuff that we've done in Jane's PICRU, Perinatal Intensive Care Research Unit, uh, and using the ovine or sheep model of preterm infancy. Uh, you might make out squint, that might look like, given the hair on him, that might be Peter Noble, also in the audience, is, uh, was quite involved in a lot of this early research as well. But the benefit of this is that the, the, um, uh, the sheep can be managed uh, in a, an environment that's similar to what the neonatal infants would be managed in. Uh, and it's um, beneficial for trying to investigate some of these clinical exposures. Before I get into the actual um, uh, experiments that we were doing, I just uh, thought I'd quickly mention the ways in which we assess the diaphragm function so we can kind of put some of these results into context about what, what these changes might mean in terms of the actual function and um, functional capacity of the diaphragm. So this just shows you a, a small section of the diaphragm that we dissect out of the sheet. Um, from this section, um, we actually 
uh, cut some longitudinal strips of the diaphragm fiber here, so it's much smaller. The actual experimental preparation is much smaller than this. So this shows you the, the rib attachment uh, at one end and the central tendon at the other. So we dissect out a longitudinal strip of that, tie it with some threads on each end and put it in our organ bath so we can measure the contractile um, properties, the force production of the muscle when it's electrically stimulated. Um, and it's important to point out when we electrically stimulate it, what we're looking at is the activation of the excitation contraction coupling pathway. So the um, electrodes here generate action potentials in the membrane, which then trigger the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which initiates muscle contraction. Calcium is pumped back in again and we get the relaxation. So when we're stimulating the muscles, what we're doing is we're activating all of the muscle fibers, we're simultaneously activating all of the muscle fibers that are present in that strip. And we can record various um, force parameters. Um, one of the, some of the main ones we are interested in showing here, so we look at the twitch force, and that twitch force is just the response to a single action potential generated in all the muscle fibers, and the, we can characterize the time, uh, contraction time and relaxation time related to calcium release and prostate cycling and reuptake. And we can also look at the maximum force that's being produced when we stimulated at, at high frequencies. Um, so there are our extreme measures of force production, but we're also interested in how the muscle can function across um, these uh, submaximal stimulation frequencies, which are more representative of what might be happening, the way in which the muscle might be activated in situ. The other thing we're interested in um, is looking at the res resilience or the fatigability of the muscles. So we just repeatedly stimulate them isometrically at an intermediate frequency and measure the force decline over time. Uh, and we, our measure is usually the force at the end of the fatigue protocol as a, a fraction of that uh, initial force. So from this, we're actually characterizing the functional capacity of the diaphragm. And if we see changes or de decreases in these force productions, then we can um, try and relate those back to some form of contractile dysfunction, decreasing the force due to some impairment in this pathway. Um, but that's only really telling us half of the story because that's only measuring the force that's produced from the strip of diaphragm that we cut and we normalize our force measurements for how much um, tissue we have. So the other aspect that we're interested in is, um, is there a change in the amount of muscle tissue that's there? And to investigate that in some of the studies, we've looked at the protein synthesis and protein degradation pathway. So we can try and identify if there's specific muscle weakness due to um, disruption of this pathway or decrease in the total amount of um, muscle tissue that's there via alterations in the protein synthesis and protein degradation pathways. So trying to get a, a more collective view of the um, impacts of these exposures on the functional capacity of the diaphragm. All right, um, again, another step before we get into the clinical exposures, one of the first things that we actually did was to, just to try and characterize the force producing or uh, the functional capacity of the diaphragm at different uh, ages, prenatal, um, uh, prenatal and postnatal ages. So what we're showing here is just that maximum force um, production in the diaphragm muscles from uh, lambs that were delivered at different ages. So the open um, boxes here are all um, preterm deliveries. So term is about 150 days approximately. So all of these were from preterm lambs. And then we also looked at measurements at about one week, three weeks and seven weeks after. Um, and then what this shows here is that there's actually a, quite a um, striking increase in the maximum force just before that um, or between that 128 days and 145 days. So prior to that, there's very low functional capacity, very weak di um, diaphragms in these preterm lambs. And there must be a fairly rapid acceleration in that development uh, as they approach term. Uh, and they're kind of relatively consistent um, afterwards. Looks like there's a bit of a drop here. I wouldn't pay too much attention to that. I think this is just an artifact because the, at that age, the diaphragm strips were actually slightly too big for our organ bath that we're measuring. So, um, uh, yeah, so effectively the key point here is that the preterm diaphragm is really um, substantially weaker than the, the term diaphragm. We also looked at the fatigability and actually it was quite somewhat surprising because it appears that the preterm diaphragm is actually more fatigue resistant um, than the diaphragms that had, that had um, uh, been delivered at term and then measured postnatally. Um, so we can come back to some of that uh, interesting features a little bit later on. The other thing that uh, was characterized, and this was from Yong Song and Jane, um, they looked at the antioxidant capacity um, or 
presence of antioxidants and antioxidant activity over the same time frame. And similar to this large increase in force production in the diaphragm, there's also um, quite a striking increase in the um, uh, amount of antioxidants that are present uh, from the preterm to the term infants. Um, and also a similar change in superoxide dismutase um, expression and antioxidant activity over the time period. So just as this very quick snapshot, we know that the preterm infant has lower specific force uh, and also a reduced antioxidant capacity which we proposed was going to make it more vulnerable to a diaphragm dysfunction in response to some of these other clinical um, exposures that we're going to investigate. Um, the one I'm going to focus most on, and I think we've probably done the most work with in terms of the diaphragm function is uh, and a sheet model of chorioamnionitis or intraamniotic infection. And this is just a, an infection of the um, amniotic fluid or the um, uh, chorion of the fetal and placental membranes around here. And we know that in um, pregnant women, the incidence of preterm birth is greatly increased when we have um, the presence of chorioamnionitis. And uh, if you look at the very preterm infants, um, approximately or more than 70% of those very preterm infants are associated with chorioamnionitis. Um, so we know that this um, intraamniotic infection um, contributes or, or um, probably contributes to the premature birth and the premature um, spontaneous labor. Uh, but it also has some very severe ad adverse neonatal outcomes. So things like uh, fetal systemic inflammation, injuries to the lung, the brain, and the gastrointestinal system, as well as increased risk of later um, respiratory complications such as bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Um, so what we're interested in though, given the vulnerability of the preterm diaphragm, uh, is the diaphragm also affected by this uh, intraamniotic infection? So this was the model that we were using. So we're dealing with um, preterm sheep. So they were delivered at 121 days. So if you remember, this is a, a period where they would have quite pronounced weakness of the diaphragm relative to the term lambs. And they received intraamniotic injections of um, LPS, 10 milligrams LPS, either two days before delivery or seven days before delivery. And uh, at delivery, the diaphragms were removed and we measured the contractile function uh, and some of the other characteristics. The first thing we wanted to do was to establish that there was an inflammatory response um, following the LPS stimulus. And this shows a significant, a very characteristic increase in the plasma IL-6 concentration at two days, which then subsides by about seven days. And in the diaphragm, we can see an increase in uh, IL-1 beta into lupin 1 beta at the two-day period that, that um, subsides by seven days as well. So this is a very characteristic transient change or increase in the inflammatory profile, both systemically and locally in the diaphragm. Um, so we know that our LPS is uh, creating that inflammatory response. And we looked at the contractile properties of the diaphragm afterwards, and we can see in both the twitch force and the titanic force that we get quite marked decreases in the, um, the strength of the diaphragm uh, at both the two days and the seven days. Um, so this is uh, also quite interesting. So the seven days, even after the inflammatory stimulus has subsided, we're still getting uh, a significant decrease in the force compared to the control preterm lambs. And it's also worth remembering that these are even weaker than the normal term lambs as well. So this is an additional weakness of the diaphragm in addition to just the weakness um, from the fact that they're born premature. Um, the other interesting thing is we looked at um, protein degradation and protein synthesis pathways. And even though we saw similar changes in the force, the, um, uh, at two days after the LPS exposure, we saw an increase in the proteolysis pathways. And uh, seven days after, it seems to switch a little bit um, to more of a decrease in the protein synthesis. Um, so this data really suggests that we are, we do have this um, weakness of, of the diaphragm muscle, intrinsic weakness of the diaphragm due to some dis contractile dysfunction. But it's also pointing to um, atrophy um, and decreased amount of diaphragm tissue there as well. So if we look at the functional impact of this, uh, these combined effects on the diaphragm, it's likely to severely compromise the respiratory capabilities of the diaphragm. Um, all right. 
No other time. So moving on to the um, next thing we wanted to do was just to, to confirm that this was actually mediated by the inflammatory pathway. So uh, this is some work by Kana, one of our um, early PhD students who worked on this. Uh, and what we were doing here was just to um, um, block the IL-1 receptor pathway and see if blocking that, um, or see if, if this was the pathway that was contributing to the inflammation-induced diaphragm weakness. So here we just had um, uh, inju injections of the um, recombinant human interleukin-1 receptor antagonists. So these were uh, uh, administered three hours before our either LPS or saline exposure. And if we have a look at blocking the IL-1 pathway, we can see firstly in terms of the inflammatory response, this is the characteristic increase in uh, IL-1 beta in the diaphragm and increased uh, IL-6 in the plasma. And these effects were um, both abolished um, with our, when we blocked the IL-1 receptor um, pathway. So it looks like this was effective in blocking the inflammatory stimulus. And not surprisingly, we also saw that the LPS-induced diaphragm weakness was also partially um, uh, ameliorated by the blocking of the IL-1 pathway. Um, so this looks like that, um, well, certainly blocking that inflammatory response has a protective effect against the, the LPS stimulus. Um, didn't come back all the way to normal, which we kind of expected it would based on the, um, the LPS results, uh, sorry, the inflammatory results. So this suggested that there may be some other things apart from the direct uh, inflammatory pathway that might be involved. And we also looked at um, the antioxidant and, and mitochondrial activity in response to this LPS exposure. Um, so what uh, we're looking at here, so this is from the uh, two-day and the seven-day LPS exposure group. So looking at the same tissues, and this is the um, uh, mitochondrial uh, or antioxidant expression in the mitochondria from the diaphragm. And we can see that uh, in both of these, there's a significant decrease in both catalase and superoxide dismutase, uh, particularly in the seven-day uh, age group which shows um, the LPS exposure is decreasing the antioxidant um, expression. We also think that that's mediated via um, the transcription factor NRF2. Uh, so this is considered a, a sort of a global um, stimulator for increased antioxidant um, production. And we got, also got decreases in the total NRF2 as well as the nuclear uh, NRF2 contents uh, at that seven day period. So it looks like these, uh, these disruptions to the normal antioxidant signaling pathway. And we also got uh, sort of decrease in the mitochondrial respiratory chain uh, activity at complex two and complex four as well. So this is suggesting that um, uh, we've got uh, the LPS stimulus is activating or acting by the IL-1 receptor pathway contributing to diaphragm weakness. And we also may have some additional effects independent of the inflammatory stimulus uh, in some way that's um, mediated by uh, alterated alterations in the antioxidant expression and mitochondrial activity. Um, the next thing that we wanted to do was to see whether the something about the preterm diaphragm that is, or the preterm animal that's uh, uniquely vulnerable to the LPS exposure. And uh, to do that, we did, this is our similar group we had before, so two days and seven day LPS groups in the preterm lambs. And we did a similar exposure uh, to the term lambs to see whether there was, the term lambs were also as vulnerable to the LPS exposure. Um, and if we just have a look at some of the contractile properties here, first of all, we see, um, yes, the diaphragm from the um, term animals were also vulnerable to the LPS exposure. So I'm missing some labels here. This is the um, uh, the control group, and this is the LPS at two days and at seven days. And we saw decreases in the maximum force, um, but no changes in the twitch force. And if you compare that to the preterm group, which is already significantly weaker than the term group, um, we saw decreases in both the titanic force and also the twitch force. Uh, and these decreases were much larger, well, markedly larger than the, the decrease we saw in the term group. Um, so that suggests that the preterm were more uh, severely affected by the LPS exposure than the term animals. The other interesting thing that we saw was that the, um, in the term animals, we saw significant increases in the twitch contraction time, so a slowing down of the, the contractile response, and also an increase in the resistance to fatigue. Uh, and these changes were supported by some 
some suggestions of changes in the myosin isoform composition, uh, which we didn't see in the preterm in the preterm lambs. So not only are we seeing differences in the severity of diaphragm weakness from the LPS exposure, we're also seeing differences in the um, response of the term and the preterm diaphragm. So we're getting some changes in the um, contractile properties and, and myosin isoform compositions in the term animals that weren't present in the preterm. So it does seem as though the timing of this exposure, whether it's early or late in gestation, um, does change the uh, functional response of the diaphragm to the inflammation. With that in mind then, the next thing we wanted to do was to kind of further investigate this timing. So we, how critical is the timing of the exposure to um, the impacts on the diaphragm function? So again, this is our characteristic two day and seven day LPS groups in the preterm lambs. And um, we wanted to kind of push it a little bit. So we did an initial exposure, which was um, uh, out at a hundred days, so three weeks before delivery. And then we want to see, well, what happens if we have a cumulative exposure to the inf inflammatory stimulus over that period? And we had weekly injections of the LPS uh, for three weeks before the delivery. Um, so this was investigating both the, the, the timing, the timing of the initial exposure, as well as the frequency or chronicity of the exposure. And does that uh, affect diaphragm function? Now, again, um, a little bit surprisingly, if we look at the maximum force production, we can see, in, um, actually, I don't have the two-day group here, so this is just the 7, 21, and the multiple group. They all had a fairly similar decrease in the maximum force production, so they're all affected by the LPS exposure. But if we look at the, um, compare the two groups that had the initial exposure was at 21 days before delivery, um, they both responded quite similarly in some of the other um, Parameters. So they also had changes in the time to peak twitch force and, and uh, decrease in the fatigability, suggesting changes in the um, myosin isoform composition and fatigability, uh, and also increases in the um, uh, measures of oxidation, so protein carbonylation. Um, there was no real difference between any of our measures between the, just the single 21 and the multiple dose. So this, uh, I think, provides some further evidence that it's really, one of the really important things is the timing in which this first uh, exposure to LPS occurs rather than the actual frequency of that exposure. All right, um, so that's a, a bit about the initial, some of the initial work that we we're doing, looking at um, the effect of in utero inflammation, the, the sheep model of chorioamnionitis on diaphragm function at the time of birth. So all these measurements were done when the animal was killed straight away at birth and um, just to summarize, we know that the LPS caused um, impairment of contractile function that made the already weak diaphragm even weaker. Uh, there was also some evidence of um, um, muscle atrophy, increased proteolysis and decreased protein synthesis, which is gonna further compromise the functional capacity of the diaphragm. We saw changes in the antioxidant capacity and mitochondrial activity. We know it's mediated by the IL-1 receptor pathway mm -hmm. and um, the response of the diaphragm to the stimulus does, is quite heavily influenced by the timing of that exposure. So with all that in mind, um, what was really the next step, I think, was to investigate the effect of these in utero exposures on the postnatal diaphragm function. So if the, the sheep had been born um, with all of these um, complications already, the capacity to be able to um, initiate and sustain a ventilation throughout that um, early postnatal period is likely to be uh, heavily compromised. So that's what we um, plan to do. This was the experimental um, design and this work was done largely by Chris Yastel, another PhD student. Um, so in this study, we had uh, two of the um, postnatal groups, so the LPS and the saline group, and they um, received either LPS or saline two days before delivery at 129 days, so slightly older gestation than what we'd used previously. And then they were kept, um, kept alive and maintained in a normal, um, I guess, uh, clinical environment, simulating the neonatal practices. And then they were euthanized or killed at, um, one week later at seven days postnatal age. And we measured their diaphragm function at that time point. Uh, they were compared to our fetal control group. And these ones um, were remained in utero all the way up until delivery at 136 days. So they had the same post-conceptional age um, but these postnatal groups have been alive and, and um, breathing and surviving for a week um, outside of the uterus, whereas these were um, just delivered and killed uh, at, at the same time point. 
So we're really interested in, um, well, what's the combined effect of this preterm delivery and the LPS exposure on the capacity of the diaphragm to, to maintain uh, its respiratory functions in that first, um, first week of life. So it was somewhat surprising to see these results that we got. Um, so um, what we're showing here, so this is the maximum tetanic force. So this is just showing the um, maximum force produced by both the saline and the LPS groups compared to the fetal control group. And the surprising thing there was that um, there was no, no significant difference between the LPS group and the saline group. So the LPS exposure didn't seem to have any adverse effects on the postnatal diaphragm function at seven days um, after preterm birth. And um, nor were there any differences between these two groups and any of the other measurements that we, uh, that we looked at as well. So the twitch force or the peak twitch force of the half relaxation time. So no difference between the saline and LPS groups, but the, the thing that did stand out was that both of these groups were um, significantly different in many of the measurements to the fetal control group. Uh, so these ones, remember, they're all at the same post-conceptual age. Uh, the fetal controls have stayed in utero for the whole time period where these have been out um, and, uh, and surviving, breathing and, um, and, and living outside of the womb for seven days. And um, one of the critical things is that both of these groups have um, higher specific force, well actually the saline group had higher specific forces um, than the fetal control group, so they're stronger and they had um, lower twitch, uh, maximum twitch forces, but also much faster time to peak and half relaxation times. And because of this difference in the timing, we also saw a rightward shift of the force frequency relationship for these two postnatal groups. Um, now you might think, oh, that doesn't look particularly good, but the thing to remember is that these characteristics of so this um, higher maximum force, lower twitch force, and the faster twitch contraction times are more representative of the contractile properties that you would see in a, in a more mature muscle compared to the naive muscle. Um, and that's shown um, uh, also in this characteristic shape of the force frequency relationship. So what we think is happening here is that these two postnatal groups, because they've been delivered and then they actually have to go through this transitional period from in utero life to extra utero life. And there's an increased demand on the respiratory muscles. And there may be a, um, acceleration of the maturation of the diaphragm compared to those uh, lambs that were kept in utero for that whole time period. Um, however, the other thing that we need to consider though is what was actually happening to these saline and LPS groups uh, after delivery. And they were managed in the normal kind of um, clinical practice. Um, and um, some of them required vent um, ventilatory support and we also needed to manage the nutritional um, uh, supply and um, feeding of the animals as well. And when we combined these two groups, or actually when we, we looked at those um, elements, we saw that the LPS group had um, a lower average protein intake over that time period. And they also had a much longer duration of, of mechanical ventilation. So they required respiratory support for much longer than the saline uh, saline groups do. So even though they didn't have differences in their contractile properties, there was quite marked differences in their manage, postnatal management. And um, with Jane's help, uh, Chrissy did some um, principal component analyses and, and pulled out these two parameters, duration, mechanical ventilation, and the protein intake. Um, and uh, together, they contributed to a parameter we called illness severity. And um, this illness severity uh, explained a fair amount, that 70% of the variation that we saw in the maximum force when we combined these two saline and LPS groups, and also a high proportion of the variation in the inflammatory stimulus as well. So I think this, the take home message from this is I think that um, when the animals are delivered in that initial transition um, to postnatal life, they actually undergo quite uh, increased mechanical demands that can accelerate the adaptation of the diaphragm uh, to, to a more mature type of um, contractile properties. But we also need to consider the way in which they're managed in the postnatal environment and um, try and tease out the independent effects of things like mechanical ventilation and nutritional intake, uh, as well as the exposure to the um, glucocorticoids and, uh, and the LPS um, stimuli. So we really need to take, take into consideration the multitude of factors that are influencing the diaphragm function in these um, 
complex models. All right, um, so I'm going to leave the sheet there for a moment. And in the last um, couple of minutes, I just wanted to mention some of the uh, other things that we've done in terms of uh, looking at diaphragm function. And um, I think it gives us a little bit of an insight into some of the unique characteristics of the neonatal diaphragm in particular. So this is some of the work that Tony's been driving, and this is looking at the um, neonatal rat diaphragm. And one of the interesting things that we identified there was that in the neonatal um, diaphragm, we actually have a, quite a prolonged relaxation of the um, contractile force from a titanic contraction. And if you compare it to an adult, um, an adult would have a, a much more rapid relaxation similar to this dotted line here. So we've got a unique slowing of the, the relaxation phase um, in the neonate. And this slowing of the relaxation can be blocked by the stretch activated channel blockers uh, like streptomyosin. So this uh, we think is, is due to the high presence of stretch activated channels in the neonatal diaphragm. And um, if we look at the timing, this relaxation time, so this is the streptomyosin group here where we block those channels compared to the controls. We can see that we have a um, early on, this is about seven, seven or eight days um, uh, postnatal age in the uh, rat diaphragm. We get very large differences here, but that effect is, is um, quickly diminished over about um, by about day 14. So this points to some unique aspects or, or characteristics of the neonatal diaphragm and its contractile properties. And it may be that this uh, prolonged relaxation is related to influx of calcium that's contributing to the acceleration and, and development of the diaphragm in that early postnatal period. Another interesting result was um, from a, um, a honor student this year, Jess Joseph, and she's, she was looking at the effects of hypothermia on neonatal diaphragm function. Um, and the take home message from this is that in the adult, when we increase the temperature from 25 to 42 degrees, um, we actually get a very typical decrease in contractile function, the hypothermia induced contractile dysfunction in the adult. Um, but surprisingly, when we did the same thing for the neonates, we were expecting the neonate to, to um, be more effective than the adult, if anything. Um, but what we saw was the neonatal diaphragm actually increased force production at the higher temperature. Um, so not only is it we didn't get a decrease in the, in the um, hypothermia-induced uh, force production, but it actually increased, went the opposite direction. Um, and this difference only appears to come out when, we, when we're operating at high temperatures, about 42 degrees. And if we keep them at that temperature, the adult diaphragm has this continual decrease in force over time, whereas the neonatal diaphragm can sustain that force production at, at quite a long time. So I just put this up here to, just to illustrate some of the really uh, unique aspects associated with the diaphragm of the neonatal diaphragm function um, that we haven't really understood and, and probably haven't appreciated to um, as greater extent uh, in some of our earlier work. Um, the last things I was going to mention, um, just because Kimball is here, um, we also looked at, so we were interested in uh, various other aspects about um, antenatal exposures and how that affects postnatal diaphragm function. And um, one of the, the interesting things is that we might, I think the, the timing of these insults and also the manifestations of them on diaphragm function might not appear immediately um, after birth. And this is an example here. So with Kim, we were looking at um, a model of intrauterine growth restriction. So where they're putting a hypoxia, hypoxic exposure during this mid period of gestation. And then we evaluated the diaphragm function um, in adults, so in eight, um, eight week old mice. And um, the interesting thing there, even though the exposure was happening in utero, when we looked at the diaphragm function um, later on, we saw well, at, at birth, we saw significant decreases in the body weight. So we know that there was IEGR, a growth restriction present. And when we measured the diaphragm function, even though we didn't see large changes in the maximum force production, we did see changes in the um, contractile properties. So the uh, prolonged uh, relaxation time and changes in fatigability of the muscle that manifests out at, at eight weeks um, in, in the adult. So even though we don't we do some of these in utero exposures, we might not see some events early on in the postnatal life, but they may actually manifest later on um, uh, in adults as well. I might, uh, in the interest of time, I probably should leave it there. I, um, in my next talk, I might go on and talk a little bit about some of the other um, different ways in which we've characterized diaphragm function. Uh, so this is some work looking at OCT measurements, looking at 
um, the thickness and, um, and elastic modulus of the diaphragm in a TGF alpha model of lung disease. We can relate that to decreases in diaphragm function as well. Uh, and some more recent work that um, we've done that um, Irene's been involved in looking at how um, other diseases like um, mucopolysaccharidosis or lysosomal storage disorder, how that impacts on diaphragm function. Um, and a lot of the work that Irene's done has characterized the decrease in the maximum force production in these MPS diaphragms, um, which are also present not only in other models of MPS, but also in um, uh, peripheral limb muscles as well. Uh, so there's a nice little story in there. I don't have time to go into a bit about the, um, the potential impacts of these lysosomal storage disorders on the functional capacity and functional properties of the diaphragm in these uh, MPS mouse models of um, human diseases. All right, I'll leave it there and just thank a whole bunch of people that have been involved in, in all of this research over the last well, 12 years, 16 years or whatever it's been. Thank you. A couple of things. One, the hypothermia in the mice is really interesting, and I wonder how much that's related to actually normal um, functional temperatures in the animals. So then, fecal hunger is usually going to have to burn higher than the maximum surface. I presume that's the same thing with the mice here, and these temperatures are um, that they might be functional to. Yeah, a good question. Um, I should uh, should go and ask Jess because I know you asked that in the seminar for everyone. So, so that was uh, yeah. So that was Jess's work. Right? Um, she's just done this, um, finished off this year for for her honours. But um, now it's, it's a very good point. The they've um, got a high body surface area ratio too, so it probably lose that. Yeah, yeah. So I think um, the short answer is I don't know what the temperature is in um, in the um, uh, in the pups, um, particularly when they're um, you know, nesting with each other and, and newborn. Um, there is the issue about the, the surface area ratio. So I don't know. They're probably huddling in that environment close together to try and conserve the heat. So um, that would suggest maybe that um, there may be um, requirements to try and elevate that. That temperature. Um, the adaptation, I suppose, if you're talking about half degree, then you might wonder whether it, it's that large enough to see the protective effects. You know, we're, we're going from normal, we assume a normal body temperature is 37 up to 42, so it's quite a large uh, increase. The thing that we did notice was that we didn't see that any changes manifest until we get to above 37. Um, so even at 37, they were relative to their own forces at 25 and 30 degrees, they're, they're quite stable. Um, I think my impression, uh, my initial thoughts about why the force is increasing there is, um, could be explained by changes in the cross bridge cycling rates that, um, that we, uh, we differences that we'd expect from the neonatal mice and compared to the adults. So the, the neonates are much more slower to contract and to relax and they have, um, the high proportions of the embryonic and neonatal isoforms there and the, the cross bridge cycling rate is much slower. So if you're increasing the temperature, one of the consequences of that is a more rapid um, transition of the, the cross bridge cycling. And there's some of the work with actually KW did back when I was a postdoc in Bristol, started out doing isolated muscle stuff. He was doing some laser jump experiments where you'd actually rapidly expose muscle preparation to a, a laser which increases the temperature. So you get a, in milliseconds an increase in the temperature in that environment and you saw a transition to a, from a low cross bridge force producing state to a high state because of that increase in thermal energy. So um, I think there may well be a, impacts on that higher temperature on the cross bridge cycling rate and that contributes to the increased force production. But yeah, I think it's, it's a very different response to the, to the adult. Um, and there's probably other explanations. Some adaptation might be part of that as well. <laughs>
Thanks, yeah, that was great. Uh, I remember you started doing some intercostal uh, muscle experiments. Did you, did you ever get those to, to work or are they more difficult to work with? You'd have to refresh my memory. Did we do intercostal? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, I think the short answer is no, it didn't go anywhere because <laughs> um, we did play around with it. We did try a little bit, and I think that was because we did have the, the larger diaphragm preparations. Um, and uh, the, the problem with that is, so with these diaphragms, they're nice to work with because they're long, thin strips, and you can dissect them out and have a relatively intact preparation without damaging it. With the intercostals, they tend to kind of cross over so that you got some fibers, internal and external intercostals that overlap with each other. And there's also quite a thick um, connective tissue on the outside of them. So because of that arrangement, it's really difficult to, to try and, you, well, you basically can't dissect out these nice long strips. Um, so I think that was the main issue that we had. But, um, Do you answer. expect that the fiber type composition would be the same for the intercostals? I think there'd be similarities there. Well, one of the things, I mean, in terms of the fiber type composition, I think that the biggest difference that we'd see is a transition from the neonatal embryonic isoforms to the adult ones. And I think you'd see that same transition um, for the intercostals. Um, yeah, but they, they, I imagine there'd be similarities in the, in the functional requirements of, of the intercostal versus the diaphragm muscles. So I wouldn't be surprised if there was a similar fiber type composition even in the adults as well. Very quick um, question with clinical on Streptomycin was interesting. A lot of babies succeed in their life signs. So, is that uh, an effect specifically restricted to streptomycin, or is it a common to all minor life signs? Um, the use in use of gentomycin, for example. Yeah, well, the, the reason for using streptomycin here is because it's, it's a very general blocker of the stretch activated calcium channel. So, it wasn't used for a for a clinical purpose so, per se. Um, we've done, well, yeah, yeah, no, it's really interesting. I couldn't answer that, but I do know that we, we can see similar effects when we use other um, stretch activated channel blockers as well. Gadolinium, I think, has been used and, and various other ones. So, um, but yeah, I mean, it could be interesting to see if, from a clinical point of view, if that's actually uh, does have an impact on this contractile properties and, Maybe detrimentally, if, you know, idea of you know the prolonged re uh, relaxation actually being a trigger for growth and development at that early age is true. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, what's the mechanism behind the um, fatigue resistance that you've got, and why do you think it's higher in your, your prenatals as opposed to your postnatals? Uh, yeah, very good question, and I think well. That was a bit of a conundrum at the start as well, because all the literature that we read early on was that you know these neonatal um, diaphragms and neonatal muscles have very low proportions of uh, type one fatigue resistant fibers. Um, so you'd expect based on that that they would be very fatigable. Um, what's not coming out of that story is that they don't have a lot of myosin one, but that's the adult myosin that they were that they were looking for and staining for back then. They weren't actually necessarily looking at the embryonic and the neonatal isoform. So Yes, you've got a low, lower proportion of the fatigue-resistant adult ones. It's probably somewhat, not quite, um, slightly misleading the information that I presented. But um, the, the difference is that they do have a high proportion of these embryonic neonatal isoforms. And as I was just mentioning with Jane, with the temperature-based stuff, they actually have very slow contraction relaxation rates. <coughs> so the ATP consumption is going to be likely to be very slow. They also have um, high mitochondrial density. Um, so I think based on those properties that, that can explain the, the decrease in the fatigability uh, in those preparations. So I think it's, it's more about the ATP consumption for that slower um, cross recycling process. Yeah, so if we do the eccentric contractions, yeah, that, yeah. So, so they didn't have the same structural kind of rigidity in those sarcomeres. So as you do the eccentric contractions, they they get damaged more, but they were more resistant to the fatigue as well. So, any questions? Uh, the hypothermia of funds were very interesting, producing the opposite effects in adults and neonates. Have those been done looking at hypothermia 
Um, did you also see opposite effects in afternoon? Um, that's a good question. I, I don't know of any studies that have looked in the neonate versus adult comparison in the hypothermia, but um, there is a, yeah, the hypothermic effects on adult skeletal muscles are fairly well characterized. And we know that you know, there's um, non shivering thermogenesis and kind of uh, thermoregulatory adaptations that we get in skeletal muscle at lower temperatures um, to try and uh, increase state TP consumption. So, calcium leak from the SR and sort of recycling of calcium um, to try and maintain temperature um, in those hypothermic conditions. Um, be good, yeah, I don't know. It'd be a good question to look at to see whether there's a differential effect in the neonate versus the adult.